The Vatican, the home of the Pope, receives millions of visitors every year despite being the smallest country in the world. Why? The seat of the Bishop of Rome is a landlocked enclave in Rome. Even though the Vatican exists as a country today, it has historically been a part of Rome. As a country surrounded by Rome, it can be said that it still is a part of Rome. Today, the image of the Vatican's power stems from its monarchy, with the absolute ruler being the Bishop of Rome. But the institution's power has a long history. While the Vatican came into being as a sovereign state in 1929, the history of this nation-state and its gradual rise to power began hundreds of years ago. This religious institution grew through the centuries to become one of the fiercest political institutions in Western Europe. While Catholics trace the history of the papacy to St. Peter, we shall start from the fall of Rome since our concern is the social and political ascendancy of the papacy. During the 4th and 5th centuries, the papacy tried to impose its superiority over the whole Christian church. Before this, the church did not need a superior overseer, the jurisdiction of the pope, or any other religious leader. However, the social changes of early medieval Europe demanded a new type of leadership. The bishops began acting as shepherds to the ecumenical society, and even the whispers of an ecumenical state started developing. Pope Damasus I was the first bishop of Rome who officially demanded the papacy's supremacy over all churches. His papacy began in 366 and lasted until his death in 384. At the Ecumenical Council of 382, he explained that the Lord bestowed this primacy on St. Peter, the first bishop of Rome. In other words, Peter was the first pope. The first pope who started taking the initiative on the matter was Pope Siricius, the Bishop of Rome from 384 to 399. In his decretals, the decisions on ecclesiastical law, Siricius claimed the sole right to make decisions on doctrinal and disciplinary matters. Pope Siricius's claims received mixed feelings in the West and strong opposition in the East. But the most potent opposition at the time came from the African Church, which wanted to remain independent. Pope Leo I represented the turning point of the papacy's history. Serving as the Bishop of Rome from 440 to 461, he did not only express his wish for papal superiority, but he also claimed authority in Spain and Africa. Leo had a commanding character and was a diplomatic genius who drew on previous papal experiences and claims to formulate a doctrine of papal supremacy. He explained that St. Peter was the rock on which the church was built, just like Jesus said. The bishops of Rome were not only the successors of St. Peter, but also personified him. Thus, the office of the Bishop of Rome meant that he was the supreme ruler of the universal church. Other bishops were there to help the Pope and share some of his responsibilities. Leo also played an important historical role by meeting with Attila the Hun in 452 and persuading the pagan leader to abandon his plans of sacking Rome. For his service to Catholicism and Rome, he is considered a doctor of the church. The involvement of Catholic figures in politics helped elevate their rank in the Roman Empire. When the Roman Empire faced its gradual downfall, the popes did not despair. First, the imperial administration of the Western Roman Empire collapsed, and the disintegration of Roman society followed. The papal office was well aware of the social changes, as the once civilized Romans were now replaced with the invading barbarians. They would shape a new Western society out of the ruins of the Western Roman Empire. In the bleak reality of early medieval Europe, one man stood as a shining light of hope, and he occupied the throne of St. Peter. This man was Pope Gregory the Great. Profoundly spiritual, well-educated, and brilliant, Pope Gregory gave the papacy direction. Gregory was a well-loved individual in Rome because he was a wealthy nobleman who spent all of his riches on founding monasteries and helping the poor. He turned his palace into a monastery, where he continued to live the ascetic life. He was pushed into the papacy because the people had elected him. Gregory I laid the foundation for the Christendom of the Middle Ages due to four impressive achievements, establishing popes as the de facto rulers of central Italy, strengthening the papal primacy over the Western churches, starting the conversions of the Anglo-Saxons, and shaping medieval Christian thought through his many theological writings. Pope Gregory the Great established the superiority of the Roman See above all other Western churches by meddling in their work. He claimed that the See of St. Peter was dominant and that all bishops and monks should obey the Pope. 
especially when it came to disciplinary measures. He also advised them to always look to Rome when in need of spiritual or diplomatic guidance. The marriage of Rome and Catholicism has its roots in late antiquity. The relationship kept evolving in the early Middle Ages as missionary work became the forefront of Catholic practice. Over the centuries, the Catholic Church began emerging as a prominent political force. An essential aspect of this political power can be traced to the era of Charlemagne. With his conquests, Charles managed to reconstruct the political unity of the Western Roman Empire. In 800, Charles traveled to Rome to clear Pope Leo III's name, as he was accused of adultery and perjury. On Christmas, the Pope suddenly put the imperial crown on Charles's head and proclaimed him emperor in St. Peter's Basilica. Since the Pope performed the coronation, it was regarded as the will of God, and the new title bestowed on Charles was holy. Since the Pope thought of the Roman Empire as one and being indivisible, he believed that Charles had the right to claim both the Western and Eastern Roman Empires. This eventually led to the East-West Schism in the 11th century, after which the position of the Catholic Church at the top of the Western food chain became evident. During the 9th century, the Popes even gained the right to intervene in the state's affairs. The state was no longer a distinct political entity, rather, it was seen as one of the many aspects of the Church. At the end of the 9th century, Pope John VIII managed to win the papal right of not crowning the emperors, but also choosing them. By the 12th century, the papacy was witnessing a slight decline. With the renewed popularity of Aristotle's writings, the learned people tried to harmonize the human experience with faith. The most successful among them was Thomas Aquinas. The popularity of Aristotle grew even more with the discovery of Arabic commentators, who emphasized the lack of religion in his writings. At first, the ecclesiastical authorities prohibited the development of a rational way of thinking, and the works of Aristotle, especially in the universities of Paris and Oxford, were banned in 1210. By the middle of the 13th century, the study of Aristotle and rationalism was prevalent. The 13th century saw the rise of national monarchies and the decline of imperial authority. But the emperors would not allow the fall to be theirs alone. They brought the papacy down with them. At the start of the 14th century, the idea of Christendom was replaced with a new theory. The largest autonomous political unit in Europe should be a national state. The decline of the Catholic Church continued with the Western Schism, which saw multiple papal claimants and was further fueled by the Reformation. By the 14th century, the Vatican was being used as a papal residence. Before this, the popes had stayed at the Lateran Palace in Rome and even in Avignon, France, for a short time. The consolidation of the Western Church in Rome led to the eventual formation of the Vatican as a sovereign state. However, to begin the tale of the papacy's influence with its arrival back in Rome would be ludicrous and offensive to the truth. As an institution, the Church accumulated its wealth and garnered its socio-political influence over Western Europe in the Middle Ages. This standing was threatened with the Reformation, when Martin Luther split the Church in two and was further undermined by the ideas of the Enlightenment. Nevertheless, Catholicism enjoyed a period of rejuvenation between these two events. After the split, the need for reforms was evident, but a counter-reformation movement had sprouted within the institution. The Church was divided on how to deal with the changing times, and to some extent, the Church did regain its spiritual elan and its zest for revision and amends. The Catholic fervor for the reformation of the Church came to a halt by the middle of the 17th century. But this time, the change was not religious. Throughout Europe, intellectual and cultural thought shifted from a Christian viewpoint to a secular one. Those who participated in the new intellectual and artistic movement, known as the Enlightenment, took away knowledge from the hands of the Church and offered an alternative in regard to the universe, human nature, civilization and society, science, and even religion. The world they created was free of ecclesiastical control, which allowed the secular culture to rise. The main principles of the Enlightenment came from social experience and reason not the Gospels and the Church as an institution. With its roots deep in tradition, the Catholic Church resisted the change and took a defensive stance against modernity. It could not develop its religious thought any further and meet the secular thinkers on common ground, so it condemned and repressed the new ideas. With the French Revolution, the changing of the guard was clear to all and sundry. The result of the Enlightenment was a permanent divorce of secular and religious thought, of modern culture and the Church. This divorce has lasted to modern times. Due to the Church's meddling in political affairs, 
Europe began detesting the Catholic restrictions. In France, many cults sprouted and tried to replace Catholicism. Among them were Robespierre's Cult of the Supreme Being and Theophilanthropy, the latter of which came the closest to becoming a new national religion. As the church was forced to retreat, it found its footing in Rome, as always. Historically, Rome has remained the hallowed ground for Catholics, and as such, the consolidation of Catholic power in the Vatican today should come as no surprise. None of the newer religions managed to survive for long, and many people reverted to Catholicism to satiate their spiritual needs. The French Revolution had created a clear separation of state and religion. One can even say that the French Revolution freed the church by shattering the monarchy it used to serve. No more did enlightened rulers install their people in the church's offices. The old order ended, and the popes were now free to rebuild Rome as the vital center of Catholicism. The church was finally free to return to its original spiritual mission. In 1867, after having published the Syllabus of Errors, in which he had opposed liberal thought, Pope Pius IX announced his call for the First Vatican Council, giving the impression that it would unite the church against the rationalism of the 19th century. But this tirade against progressive thought and liberalism was cut short by the arrival of the Industrial Revolution. Leo XIII, the successor of Pius IX, was not liberal, but he understood the need to accept the changing times. He wanted to elevate the church and start a better relationship with modern secular civilization. He instituted a commission to advance the historical research of the Gospels. He also opened the vaults of the Vatican archive to serious scholars, allowing them to glimpse into the spiritual knowledge previously reserved only for the high clergy. By taking a less rigid approach, the Catholic Church was able to stay relevant in the modern age. While the church has moved away from its ultra-conservative outlook on life, the Vatican remains a place where tradition trumps modernity. The small country may not have its own armed forces, but it controls media outlets, issues passports, and mints euros. Today, the Pope exercises absolute power in the spiritual realm and in the Vatican, but his purview is quite limited in earthly matters. The separation of powers, as suggested by Montesquieu during the Enlightenment, does not exist in the Vatican, making the Pope the supreme judge, legislator, and executive. However, outside the Vatican, the Pope is primarily involved in humanitarian missions worldwide. He travels as an ambassador of peace, love, and kindness and attracts tourists to the Vatican. We hope you enjoyed this video on what makes the Vatican so powerful. To learn more about the Vatican, check out our book, Catholic History, a captivating guide to the history of the Catholic Church, starting with the teachings of Jesus Christ through the Roman Empire and Middle Ages to the present. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free Mythology Bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.